One of the first things you notice about Persona 4 Golden is that it cares about its aesthetics. Its intro is colorful, upbeat, and it's fairly lengthy. It's to the point where it wants you to be fully engrossed in it to where you won't want to skip it each time you start it up. Though this could be said of the cutscenes featured throughout its entirety, the first few I saw during the start were pretty epic. I eventually started to think that more anime cutscenes were needed. I'm sure that it's mainly because I'm a big anime fan, but I really appreciated the cutscenes. What sucks is that they're few and far between. I'm sure that they weren't used as freely as I would have liked due to an anime adaptation being a thing, but at the same time, numerous hours could go by without me seeing an anime cutscene. I guess you could say that the style of the cutscene spills over into the rest of P4G, but it's to a lesser extent. The in-game graphics and the overall appearance is still appealing, but it felt a little drab in comparison to what's showcased during the intro and the cutscene spread all over P4G. What I liked about the art style was that it's a good mix of different styles. This is worth mentioning because anime has all sorts of styles that are used and depending on where your tastes lie, you may end up preferring anime that's more realistic or cartoony. With P4G, there's a good mix of both, so it's able to appease more than one group of fans. In bringing up how P4G most likely appeased to multiple fans with the use of its art style, the same could be said of its use of the overall town and dungeons to offer different kinds of gameplay within the same game. It's worth noting that I'm aware of the fact that this is an old game. Persona 4 was initially released back in 2008 and I played the Steam version of P4G which was released this past June. I'm aware of all that, but I was still bothered by how it functioned while you were in the town known as Inaba. I felt that there's a bit of a disconnect between what's done around town and what's done inside of a dungeon. The more I played on, the more I realized that I preferred being inside of dungeons. I ended up feeling that I would have enjoyed P4G even more had I been better able to control how much time I spent in town. At first, being in the town isn't that bad. With P4G largely being a turn-based RPG, you'd think that battling makes up more than half of it, but that's not quite the case. Alongside dungeon crawling, a great deal of P4G involves you spending time in town. It eventually gets to the point where you can travel to a nearby urban center, but you really don't spend much time in that location. There are a decent number of activities meant to keep you entertained in town, but after a while, they get to be pretty repetitive. Off the top of my head, some of the activities involved after school clubs, hanging out in the town's equivalent of a mall, visiting an inn with a hot spring, and generally just hanging out with your party members along with some side characters. I wouldn't go so far as to say that you can blindly go through the activities that are offered, but it was pretty easy to turn off my mind when doing them. This part of P4G seemed as if it was more about observing rather than participating. At first it appears as if there are endless options for entertainment in town, but in reality, most of the time you're just getting dialogue that's specific to whichever activity you decide to take part in. All of this felt like portions of a visual novel. I enjoyed some of these visual novel portions of P4G, but they weren't used as frequently as I would have liked. On the plus side, these portions stood out because it felt as if a greater degree of effort was put into making the dialogue more memorable. When the visual novel segments weren't in use, I felt a bit bored because it felt as if I was coasting by waiting for something more exciting to happen. I guess it works to showcase the sometimes mundane nature of being an adolescent in school, but it quickly got repetitive constantly going to school, harvesting vegetables, reading, and studying. Like I said, some of these segments were memorable, but it wasn't like that all the time and you just wanted to move on. What frustrated me was that there were a decent number of activities to choose from, but they stopped being special when I realized I really wasn't in control of my character when choosing to do them. For example, I was disappointed to find out that soccer practice didn't involve some kind of a special minigame or something to keep me entertained. Every now and then, the coach would randomly ask me trivia questions and the overall sequences led to special interactions with side characters, but that wasn't enough for me. With what was done in the rest of P4G, it would have been possible to feature something like a penalty shootout or something else that would have had me exercise more control over the situation. Unfortunately, this also spilled over into other activities such as riding your scooter around town. The use of the scooter isn't immediately available. P4G slowly pushes you towards that direction and it's only when you're studying to get your license that you see that it'll soon be available. Much like the soccer practices, I expected to be able to use the scooter in a minigame of some sort. Maybe I'm too demanding, but it would have been nice to have been able to control the scooter myself and having to dodge traffic, race against my party members, or just being able to freely ride around town. The scooter got a decent amount of time dedicated to it, but it was disappointing to find out that it could only be used up to a certain point. Prior to the scooter no longer being available, you could decide to ride every now and then to access new areas of the town, the nearby urban center, 
or to go on day trips to the beach or the hot spring with your friends. All of this was slowly introduced and done over the span of say 5 to 10 hours, but once you'd seen what the scooter had to offer, it was no longer usable. Knowing that this would be a lengthy game, I expected to be able to get more use out of it. Like I said, it would have been nice to have been able to use it in special mini games or at the very least continuing to use it in a different way. I guess that you being able to use it to visit the beach and the hot spring with your friends does count towards that, but it's not to the extent that I would have liked. You are able to keep using the scooter to a point, but it's usually shown in a very short and transitory moment. Even when I could still keep going somewhere with a friend, P4G would quickly jump to your next destination and you're left feeling as if there was no point in the scooter being built up as something glorious to attain. Maybe this is me just nitpicking, and what I'm about to discuss was meant to capture the real life decisions that would occur as a high school student, but it bummed me out having three people asking me to hang out on the same day and having to choose between all of them. From what I experienced, there weren't serious repercussions as a result of you turning someone down, but you did miss out on socializing with them, so I'm sure that resulted in you having to take longer to max out your social link with them. It would have been cool to have been able to socialize and do all sorts of activities for as long as I wanted, but I'm sure that would have caused a problem with how P4G goes through a day-by-day -day schedule. This was just one general moment in which three of the characters asked me to hang out, but there eventually came a point where the choice to be made wasn't as easy as I would have liked. As I previously mentioned, there are numerous after-school clubs that you can decide to participate in. Seeing as how they align with my personal interests, I decided to join the school's band and the soccer club. Though both of them took place in school, they allowed you to interact with different people and special situations arose as a result of you participating in either of the activities. Rather than being an active participant, I really just felt like an observer. I felt this way and yet there came a point where I had a hard time choosing between going to band or soccer practice. As strange as it may come off, I felt sad choosing one activity over the other. It was mainly because I knew that I'd be turning down the friends I had made in either of the clubs that I was a member of. I wanted to be able to participate in both of the clubs on the same day, but P4G could sometimes be pretty strict with how you spend your time outside of dungeons. When it came to being active in town and in the dungeons, there were clear differences between which areas you happen to be playing through. I'm sure that some will think that gameplay between the town and the dungeons was balanced, but that's not how I felt. To me, it felt as if too much time had to pass between each dungeon. I realized that this had to be done to an extent, seeing as how too much time spent in the dungeons would be overwhelming, but at times I was getting bored and going through the motions of what was expected of me in town. It could be that maybe I'm just not used to how Persona games are, seeing as how this is my first real experience with the series, but I'm really not that interested in controlling my character during mundane activities. I was having to look for ways to entertain myself, when most of the interesting stuff was already maxed out and was more or less unavailable. There were moments where I even wondered if I was playing P4G the way it was meant to be played. It was either that or the activities that were available to me just weren't that engaging. Sometimes I'd force myself to read or study despite the skills gained through those activities already being at a high level. I figured I had to do something besides going to school and immediately heading home to sleep, just to repeat the same cycle the next day. Part of me wanted to value the time that I was given to spend in the town, but at one point I thought that it would have been great if I could just fast forward through periods of time where nothing was happening. I realized that the mechanics in P4G and the recently released Fallout games are different, but I would have liked to have been able to decide for myself when time moved. With how I've been discussing elements of the town, you'd think that every single thing about it was horrible. Fortunately, that wasn't the case and there were some parts of it that stood out to me for positive reasons. I'm sure that it has to do with the fact that a decent number of RPGs that I've played were released in the 90s and the aughts, but I was surprised to see that I was able to sell off all of my raw materials at once in the weapons shop, and that was a welcome feature that I've never encountered. I'm sure that this isn't the first RPG to have done that, but it was noteworthy because it's something simple and yet it was a time saver. With how buying and selling items is approached in other games, it would have been way too tedious to go through every single item or weapon and having to decide whether or not it's worth keeping or selling. It was nice how this part of P4G was simplified. Much like in other games that I've played in the past, I would have been forced to spend a decent amount of time comparing the stats of different items to see what's worth keeping and what should be sold. You could decide to do that here, but you were pushed towards just selling it all. At first you do realize that the weapons shopkeeper converses with you and usually has something to say for every item that you're selling, but this got old quickly. At one point you just want to get on with the interaction and move on. In general, I liked how satisfying it felt to unload a lot of items at the store immediately after beating a dungeon. I felt that way because I was curious to see what kind of new gear I had unlocked. 
With the completion of each dungeon, you always had access to new gear and sometimes the new weapons or armor would be much better than what you had on equipped. This was good to know because it made you feel more comfortable about your chances in the upcoming dungeon. I wouldn't go so far as to say that the dungeons were too difficult to get through, but depending on the equipment you had and what level you along with your party members were at, that usually helped determine how quickly you'd get through the dungeon. As I previously hinted at, some of the most entertaining dialogue came about when you were in town. It wasn't all the time, but it happened enough times that I was waiting for the next impactful or even silly thing that would be said by one of the characters. With this being an RPG, it's understandable that there'd be requirements to be able to use specific responses. I'm aware that these limitations imposed upon you are done to push you into activities that will help you level up certain stats so that the responses you really wanted were made available to you. These were usually unlocked after you reached a certain level, mainly through studying for knowledge, doing tedious work for diligence, or riding your scooter to gain courage. I understand why some responses were locked away within this system, but I thought that it would have been interesting to have been able to answer anyway. One of the main points of P4G is that it's through the power of coming together as a group and the strength of your relationships that you're able to overcome obstacles. This is seen in all sorts of ways throughout P4G, but one thing that I liked about how the dialogue system handled this was by seeing how your interactions with others change depending on your relationship level with them. As cheesy as it may sound, this made me happy. It made me feel that there was a point in interacting with these characters and it was similar to how leveling up in dungeons allowed you to defeat enemies with greater ease. The higher the relationship level you had with the characters, the more you'd be able to do or say. While this sometimes led to deep and meaningful conversations between the characters, this sometimes led to both cringy and amusing situations. It makes sense, seeing as how most of the characters are teenagers, but at the same time, there's a difference between entertaining dialogue and dialogue that feels shoehorned in just to get a cheap laugh. What was said every now and then occasionally made me groan, but there were also a decent number of moments where I felt the need to screenshot something because I knew it'd be enjoyed by others. Prior to playing P4G, I looked up how long it'd take to beat and how long to beat.com has it at 69 hours. Personally, it took me around 88 hours to get through. I have to admit, there were moments where I was rushing to try to beat it, seeing as how it was taking me longer than I expected. This wasn't as easy to do as I would have liked because there were multiple moments where it felt as if P4G was dragging. I'm sure to go back to this multiple times throughout other sections of this review, but the dragging was felt through the dialogue due to how boring it was to have to put up with situations that were just day-to-day -day stuff. The dialogue during lengthy scenes that were advancing the story tended to be more entertaining than in other places and I wanted more of that. I realized that the game wouldn't be advancing the plot every single second, but it was easy to tell the difference in quality between dialogue that was meant to advance the plot and dialogue that could be seen as filler. Moving on from discussing the dialogue, I'd now like to discuss the dungeons. One of my initial thoughts in regards to the dungeons was that I didn't expect them to be so long. The amount of time it took for me to get through each individual dungeon ranged from 3 to 7 hours. I'm sure that you may be thinking that 3 to 7 hours is quite long, but I generally felt as if they weren't too ridiculously long or short. That's true, and yet some did feel a bit longer than the others. In particular, I thought that Kanji's dungeon was pretty long. It was long, but on the plus side, his boss fight was easier than the one in Yukiko's dungeon. Once I realized how P4G would be approaching dungeons, I started to get comfortable with them. It got to the point where I didn't think that upcoming dungeons would stray too far from what the previous ones offered. I like to think that the difference in how long it'd take to get through the dungeons was done on purpose to try to mix things up a little. You'd think that more content is better, but not always. This particular thought came to me as I was playing through Rise's dungeon. I liked its appearance and how it was laid out, but I was surprised with it due to being much, much longer than I expected it to be. I could understand the dungeons being long and offering something different on each floor, but all of the floors were pretty much the same minus the different pathways that you took to reach the next floor. This started to bother me a little whenever I was hours into a dungeon. Each respective dungeon was interesting and unique at first, but that feeling faded away after the first hour or so. I bring up how I was displeased with some of the dungeons feeling repetitive after a certain point, so you'd think that I'd enjoy dungeons with backtracking, due to the fact that this has changed things up, but I didn't. The backtracking was bothersome, unexpected, and with some of the new dungeons suddenly expecting me to backtrack, I was initially lost and I didn't know where to go. I'm sure that I wouldn't have had a problem with this had it been introduced much earlier on. You yourself could decide to backtrack through the dungeon, possibly to grind or to collect items from locked chests, but that wasn't the same as being forced to backtrack in order to advance through the rest of the dungeon. 
This aspect of the dungeons annoyed me a little, but it wasn't entirely bad. The makers of P4G are merciful. They had quality of life issues in mind when it came to some of the problems that would potentially be encountered while in the dungeons. The repetitive nature of some of the dungeons and the backtracking did turn me off a bit, but I enjoyed being able to resupply, buy new weapons, and leave a dungeon whenever I wanted to. I could leave a dungeon and continue my day-to-day -day life as if nothing had happened. The need to complete the dungeon did hang over you and you were constantly reminded of this, but that really wasn't a bother. In any other RPG, the best you'd probably get would be multiple save points within the dungeon. By being able to return to town or even just the entrance of the dungeon, I was able to go at my own pace, and that sometimes helped to do away with the monotony of going through multiple floors that were very similar looking. Alongside the ability to leave the dungeon whenever you liked and continue from where you left off, I kind of got the feeling that the makers knew that players would be grinding. With this being an RPG, it's safe to assume that grinding will end up happening. Whether it was simply for the hell of it or because you were stuck with a difficult boss battle, P4G allowed grinding to be done comfortably. Inside of the dungeons, it was pretty easy to roam the same floor over and over again to keep finding enemies to beat. I know that this goes against me saying that I found it boring to go through multiple floors that more or less looked the same, but this was different. Before I jump into discussing combat, I have to admit that I played with the extra money and experience points setting turned on. Prior to starting P4G, I looked up some non-spoiler tips here on YouTube. Someone that's beaten P4G multiple times suggested increasing money and experience points received after a fight, so that's what I did. I'm sure that some of you may look down on me for having done that, but with it being an available in-game setting, I didn't feel as if I was actually cheating. I do however acknowledge that receiving extra money and experience points for every fight may have affected how things played out for me. It was mainly because I didn't really feel the need to work jobs while I was in town due to the amount of money I got from battles. Every now and then I made envelopes in my bedroom, but in the end, I was better off just battling as many enemies as I could. I'll discuss how doing this may have affected how I experienced P4G numerous times throughout this review, but for now, I'd like to continue with the combat. In most of the RPGs that I've played and from what a decent number of RPG fans like to discuss amongst themselves, how enemy encounters are approached is a big deal. I lean more towards RPGs that allow you to control when and how you face enemies. It's because random encounters can get annoying to deal with, and RPGs that make use of them recognize this themselves. This is usually seen through items or spells that eliminate enemy encounters for a limited amount of time. Random encounters may make grinding easier, but this approach usually leads to time being wasted. There are certain moments in RPGs where I'm actively seeking out battles, but there are also occasions where I just want to get through without wanting to worry about enemy encounters. You're almost always able to escape from one of these unwanted enemy encounters, but doing that takes time, no matter how brief it could be. I know that may not seem like a big deal to some of you, but with the typical RPG being over 50 hours long, every second or minute long encounter ends up being multiplied throughout the duration of a game, and that eventually adds up to a decent chunk of time. Throughout most of P4G, I felt as if the combat was fair. With other RPGs, you really don't get a lot of time to plan. It felt as if I was being encouraged to perform well. In different RPGs that I've played, progressing constantly felt like an arduous struggle, but P4G offered multiple different ways of approaching combat. Off the top of my head, you could manually control each and every party member. You could change up the AI's tactics so that it performed however you saw fit and you could even rush through battles thanks to a fast forward ability. Besides having allowed myself to have earned extra experience points and money, I went through a decent portion of P4G with my party members on autopilot. At times that did seem cheap, but it was helpful. It was both easy and comfortable to keep on using this combat feature because with other RPGs, you constantly have to be on guard. It'd be to the point where you could easily be one move away from death. With P4G, You'd control the tactics that your party members used and it was usually at least a minute between you controlling the main character, your party members doing whatever the AI feels is best for the current situation, and the enemies striking back. With how combat and other parts were laid out, it felt right for me to only be in control of the main character. I generally felt comfortable having my party members on autopilot, but there were some drawbacks. In particular, I didn't like that the party members AI pretty much never used buff spells. It's possible that this would have been done under a specific set of circumstances, but when I had my team set to heal slash support or all out assault, they didn't use spells to make their offense more efficient. Even when you didn't have your party members set to autopilot, they'd still offer support in more ways than one. 
You'd think that I'd be fully content with any and all support offered, but I wasn't completely happy with how Risei was used in P4G. I found it a bit strange that Risei wasn't a playable character. My issue with this was that you're required to go through a dungeon to rescue her, you interact with her as if she were any other party member, and yet it's only towards the end of P4G that she starts doing more than making comments as you battle. Even then, you're not really in control of what she does and that left me feeling a bit bummed out. With how you're required to socialize with Risei in order for her to be more useful during battles, it's possible that some may have even missed out on her extra abilities. With me, it was nearly 90 hours into P4G before Risei was doing much more to help me. Her special abilities, usually just spells meant for a healer type of a character, did make things a bit easier for me to handle, but it still felt as if it was too little too late. Risei not being used as much as the other party members wasn't the only issue I had when it came to P4G's combat. I thought that the party members' special attacks, especially the tag team moves, were too random. I guess you could say that these were like occasional limit breaks, but it would have been better had I had control over them. I realized that I argue for and against P4G automatically handling some situations for me, but what I disliked about this was when I had no say in the matter. Had I been able to decide whether or not to use the special attacks myself or at least made it so that the AI could freely use it, I would have been happier. Chrono Trigger is a game that utilized the approach that I'm describing. In that game, depending on which party members you chose and the combinations that were available, you could choose what kind of tag team moves to do. I felt that P4G was fair when I was breezing through most of the enemies and strangely enough, I felt the same way when I was getting beat by some of the bosses. It was a pain having to skip through cutscenes and repeating boss fights, but it was also fun and I could see why some would want to play on the highest difficulty setting. This was made even clearer once I learned that you could enter dungeons by yourself. I could see some madman doing this simply as a challenge. I'm sure that I'm not the only one that felt this way, but I liked how the difficulty of some of the boss fights forced me to be creative and think of new strategies. In previous battles, it was enough to use special items and physical attacks while the AI controlled my party members' personas, but my approach eventually had to be changed. Some of these moments took longer than I would have liked, and I thought to myself that if I were to have played on the highest difficulty level with no extra money or experience points, I'm sure it would have taken me even longer to beat it. In general, most of the boss fights weren't as memorable as I would have liked. Still, there were two in particular that I really enjoyed. It was during the retro gaming dungeon where I felt that the boss fight was one of my favorites. Having just played Undertale less than a year ago, I was vaguely reminded of it and its special approach to boss battles with its use of minigames. It wasn't to that extent here, but the different visuals being used in this fight was enough to catch my eye. Alongside that, I feel that modern games attempting to do something with retro games usually ends up coming off as a mess, but that wasn't the case here. It's usually because the retro visuals stand out for negative reasons when being used within a modern context, or there's a clash between the mechanics of a retro game and a modern one. The use of retro gaming elements in this boss battle was enough to make me appreciate it, but at the same time, I recognized the fact that it was one of the hardest and longest I had to deal with up to that point. As I reflect on some of the boss battles that stood out to me, I think one of the reasons why some of these were special was because of how they were able to evoke a feeling prior to being engaged with them. It was much later on in the Heaven Dungeon that I got the feeling that this battle was going to be long. It wasn't just because bosses took a lot of damage before they were beaten, but also because of what led up to this battle. During this boss battle, a lot of different things about it grabbed my attention. In particular, I enjoyed the music. It was different and it created a different mood that was unique to this battle. Though the overall music is great to the point where I could see myself wanting to buy the OST on vinyl, at times it was pretty repetitive. It was due to this that the moments where different music was being used stood out and I liked that. I've already mentioned that certain situations forced me to change up how I approached battles and this was one of them. It wasn't just because the boss had high HP or something like that, but it's because they had abilities that were unique to them. My partial frustration with this boss was somewhat helpful because it revealed something to me that I hadn't noticed before. It makes sense that the game's over when the main character dies, but it still left me thinking how I wish that all party members had to die before that happened. I realize that this reinforces that you're the one that matters the most, but at the same time, I guess it's because that's how I'm used to most RPGs functioning. Up to this point, I've mentioned how it was somewhat easy to coast through a great portion of P4G thanks to setting my party members to autopilot. With the Heaven boss battle, that wasn't possible. It was the first battle where I really had to protect myself from magic and it was impossible for me to do this while only controlling the main character. 
I was around 60 hours into P4G and I felt as if I was just starting to play it as if it were a more traditional RPG. This was frustrating, seeing as how I had to experiment multiple times to see what would be the best way to approach this boss, but it made things interesting and I liked that. I realize that it probably comes off as if I'm doing play by play of this boss battle, but this is worth noting because it forced me to respond in a different manner and it changed how I approached the rest of the game. No matter what kind of game you play, it'll always be interesting to have to change something about your playstyle in response to what it's doing. This didn't occur very often throughout P4G, but it happened enough times to recognize that these were special moments. I don't entirely recall the exact amount of time it took me to beat this boss, but it took me around 6 attempts. What was interesting about this was that I wasn't feeling too frustrated. I hate to admit this, but I've previously played games that were difficult and unforgiving to the point where I wanted to rage quit. Sekiro was one of those games where that occurred. I was constantly stressed out and rather than feeling as if I was enjoying myself while playing a game, it felt as if I was doing something difficult that had real world repercussions. There's something worth digging into here because even if this boss battle took me longer than I would have liked, at no point was I feeling overly stressed out from it. It was bothersome having to repeat it multiple times, but it always felt manageable. I realize that it may come off as a bit strange to admit that a boss battle had me feeling a decently sized range of emotions, but it led to one of the most fun play sessions I had with P4G. Prior to this moment, I was starting to feel a bit bored with it and it felt as if I was stuck in a routine. Looking back on this, I was left thinking that some bosses were favored over others. Maybe that wasn't done on purpose, but from what I noticed, some had special gimmicks that made them stand out and even if they were sometimes difficult to deal with, it made P4G more interesting to play through. In bringing up special gimmicks being used in boss fights, I figured now is the time to get into discussing the personas and what I thought of them. I realize that referring to personas as a special gimmick may come off as a bit dismissive, but that's generally how I look at RPGs that utilize combat specialties to stand out from other RPGs. In FF7 and 8, it was largely summons and limit breaks. In Legend of Dragoon, it was the Dragoon form. In P4G, it was the personas. Prior to actually gaining the use of personas, I initially thought that they'd be similar to summons, but later on I started to get the impression that they were more complex. Their abilities seemed to be as unique as their appearances, and I realized that it'd take me a while before I learned what each one did and how to use them. Besides collecting new personas in dungeons and letting some go every once in a while, mainly because I didn't have enough space to keep all of them, I really didn't do anything else with them. The personas were the summons in P4G and yet it was pretty easy to get through most of it without paying too much attention to them. I'm sure that things would have been different had I been playing at a difficulty setting higher than normal, but I got by thanks to using physical attacks, items, and my team using their own personas. I realize that that probably counts as me using personas, but since I really didn't have to put any sort of thought in regards to the skills that my party members used while they were being controlled by the AI, I saw that as something else. I guess I should be thankful that P4G spends the first 4-5 to five hours introducing you to its mechanics and familiarizing you with them, and yet even if I eventually learned that it was possible to combine multiple personas to get better ones with different abilities, I didn't really try to do that. Reflecting on this now, it's possible that my disinterest towards fusing personas led to another issue I had with them. I thought it was annoying that even if all the personas had one or more of the skills that I wanted to use in specific boss battles, I wasn't able to find one that was truly versatile. For the most part, I split all of the personas into two different groups depending on if I saw them as being for offensive or defensive purposes. Each of them allowed me to do more than one thing that I would have liked to have done during a specific moment, but even then, I regularly had to switch between different personas to do what I wanted to do. It was possible to find personas that would allow me to do what I wanted to do, but even then, there was always a limit. If I found a persona that could be both offensive and defensive, something about their skills still held me back. If the persona had great physical attacks, its defensive skill wasn't as effective as I would have liked or it would only work in specific situations. It's possible that the versatility I wanted was in one or many of the personas that needed to be crafted in the Velvet Room, but since I didn't bother playing around with that, I never found out if that was the solution to this. For the most part, I understand what was capable of being done inside of the Velvet Room, but I never really felt the need to use it to its fullest extent. Every now and then I'd go there to check in on the three occupants, I'd register some personas I had, and I'd casually check to see if I could make a different persona. Though I was curious to see what kind of new personas I could make, seeing as how the game itself told me that some were only available through fusing multiple personas together, I never went through with it. It was mainly because I was afraid of losing personas that I had leveled up and had gotten used to having in battle. That, 
along with not knowing if using multiple personas meant that the new one would start off at a lower level. At the time that I had this in mind, most of my personas were over level 30 and I didn't want to lose them. It's possible that this was an irrational fear and would have been done away with had I been more aware of what the Velvet Room was fully capable of, but rather than experimenting and messing up in one way or another, I just kept at it with how I was already used to playing. I figured that it'd only be necessary if I was trying to get some rare or ultra powerful persona, but since I was getting by with what I had, I didn't find it necessary to do this. As I've mentioned, I was able to get through a decent chunk of P4G without having to worry about the use of personas, so I really didn't feel the need to make new ones in the Velvet Room. I'm sure that some of you will hold that against me, but I like to think of that as proof of this game's versatility. I like to think that great games allow players to play however they want to play, but at the same time, I felt a bit bad that I practically ignored a big part of P4G. If this had been any other game, I would have eventually been forced to learn more about the Velvet Room's mechanics in order to advance. Honestly, I'm thankful it wasn't forced upon me to utilize this part of P4G. If this had been any other game, I would have eventually been forced to learn more about the Velvet Room's mechanics in order to advance. Honestly, I'm thankful it wasn't forced upon me to utilize this part of P4G. Games that overcomplicate things can be a pain to deal with, and if I can find a simple solution to a problem, I'd rather stick to that. Despite feeling this way, there were moments where I felt as if some of the boss fights that I considered difficult could have been much easier to deal with had my personas been better trained. Besides thinking that, the few times I felt motivated to try new things or change something was when a boss was too hard, or I felt confident enough to be fooling around, which was usually by using a persona I had never used before. In general, I usually just stuck to the persona that I was most familiar with and leveled them up as often as I could. Every once in a while, I tried to switch to a different one that was at a lower level, but I wasn't as strict about this as I should have been. The drawback to this was that even if most of my personas were at a decent level, a lot of them didn't have as many skills as I would have liked for them to have had. With how I was constantly cycling personas in and out, one of the drawbacks was that I'd gain a higher level persona with fewer skills, while losing a lower level one that had more to use. You'd think that this wouldn't be a problem at all, and yet I quickly realized that it would be because most of the personas had fairly basic skills to use, just after they'd been found. I eventually started to get a handle on this, but just as I was starting to solve one problem, another one was creeping up on me. I realized that games have to set limits or else gameplay would be out of balance and too easy to handle, but it was still disappointing to realize that there was a limit to the amount of skills that a persona could have and how many personas you could carry. To get around this, Personas could eventually replace old skills with new ones. It was good to realize that this was possible, but it was bothersome constantly having to choose skills to forget because your persona frequently learned new ones. It was good to realize that this was possible, but it was bothersome constantly having to choose skills to forget because your persona frequently learned new ones. I could understand this being done with a game like Pokemon, seeing as how the Pokemon have very few slots for abilities, but P4G has more than a few available slots for persona skills and yet you're constantly having to see what's worth keeping or deleting. This occurred because your persona learns new abilities as it levels up. It's possible that I wouldn't have complained about this had I not been receiving extra experience points after every battle, but I still think I would have preferred for the new abilities to have been harder to gain. Had it been that personas learn a new ability after every 10 levels or so, it would have been easier to manage your skills. Instead, my personas would learn new abilities after every 5 levels or so. It'd take more time to cross that hurdle and learn new skills under normal circumstances, but with the amount of battles that you encounter, I could imagine someone that didn't turn on the extra experience point setting having to deal with what I dealt with. On the other hand, it was sometimes easy to forget an old skill when the new one was a much better version of the old one. This wasn't always the case, but sometimes your persona would learn a new ability that was more or less the same thing, but better. It'd be like going from Fire to Fire Aga. This was a decent workaround to having to replace old skills, but it wasn't quite the same when it came to how many personas you could carry at a time. With the number of personas that you can find in a dungeon, I think it would have been better had you also been able to change the ones your teammates used. I'm sure that this ties into the fact that your persona is supposed to be something like a reflection of your true inner self, but then why is it that you as the main character can pick and choose which ones to use, whereas your partners are stuck to just one? It's possible that it's done this way to avoid having too many restrictions on you as a player and that there's a lore reasoning for this, but I'm not sure if that's actually true. Some of you may respond to this issue by saying that it's possible for them to evolve. For me, it's not the same thing as being able to freely pick and choose from the wide selection of personas that you can encounter in a dungeon. Evolving personas is definitely a good thing, 
but it seems to me as if the evolutions were more tied into story slash character development rather than to combat. What I disliked about how Persona Evolutions were handled was that it felt a bit all over the place. I'm fairly sure that I went dozens of hours without any of my party members' personas evolving, and when I least expected it, a few of them evolved within a short amount of time. Like I said, it's possible that it's because Persona Evolutions are connected to the social bonds that you form with your party members, but I would have liked for these evolutions to have been more spread out. In most typical game reviews, the story is usually one of the first things the reviewer discusses. I was thinking of doing the same thing, but the problem was that I found it too difficult to be able to freely discuss what I thought of the overall story and its pacing had I started right from the beginning of this review. It felt more appropriate to leave all of that towards the end of my review because a decent number of the issues that I had started to come up during the middle and end. There were moments where I thought something was up in the beginning, but none of those stood out as much as the ones I'll be focusing on. From what I saw, P4G has many layers to its story. It's largely a supernatural mystery, but the further you go into it, the more you realize that there's a lot more to it. It starts off pretty similarly to other games. You're a high school student temporarily moving into a small town, and you're staying with family you're not that acquainted with. Things are pretty relaxed for the first hour or so, but it's through being introduced to some of your classmates that the story starts to unfold. I realize that what I'm about to say more or less applies to just about any game out there, but with this being a long RPG that covers all sorts of topics related to relationships and overcoming obstacles as a team, the characters and how they're developed is very important. One of the best compliments I can give P4G's characters is that I'm pretty sure that I found just about every party member to be entertaining, and that's not an easy thing to accomplish. I do have my favorites, mainly Teddy, Yosuke, and Chie, due to their loud personalities and because of the sometimes outlandish things they did and said. Every character had their moment of shine in their own unique way that was tied to their personality, and I like that. Besides the short description I just finished giving of the story and some of its characters, I don't plan on summarizing it all or anything like that. I do however intend on discussing the issues I had with the story and how it was developed. One of my issues with P4G was that rather than just showing you important parts of the story, it forced you to work for them. Some will say that's a good thing, but I don't like the possibility of missing out on very important details, simply because of unknowingly making game altering decisions. Unfortunately, I had this happen to me. As I was playing and starting to feel as if I was backed into a corner, I knew what was happening to me would affect my review. In general, I think game reviews should cover someone's experiences with a game and then the point is to organize your thoughts in such a way that you express what you generally liked, disliked, mention what stood out to you for whatever reason, and how things could be improved upon. The point isn't to cover every single step you took through a game, but if something important happened that altered your thoughts, it's worth mentioning. Initially, I didn't know what to do with what happened to me. It was when I was in the hospital confronting Taro Namatame, who I viewed as the killer. P4G was heading in that direction and since it hadn't led me astray before, I assumed that what was occurring was simply more of the same. I probably should have suspected something when confronting him resulted in a lengthy dialogue scene, in which I had to choose what to say in a very specific manner, but I treated it as I previously treated any other conversation. In P4G, I more or less always approach responses as what I would say if I were in the main character's shoes. It's possible that I wouldn't have had to deal with this had I answered in the direction I was nudged towards, but that's just how I approach dialogue. I didn't think anything of this until I realized that time skipped far ahead and I knew that I messed up. It was clear to me that I got the bad ending because so much of the story was left hanging in the air and the feeling it evoked wasn't a good one. I watched the ending play out and at that point I contemplated moving on to the next game I had to play. I thought about this for a few minutes, but I knew that I wouldn't feel good reviewing a game where I had missed out on what could be considered the standard story. I could have just stopped playing once I got this ending, but at the same time, I felt as if that would have resulted in a misleading review. Though I'm definitely not a completionist, I do try to experience as much of the main storyline a game has to offer. Even when I played RPGs back in the 90s slash early aughts, I never fully completed them. I finished the story and then usually just replayed them the exact same way I initially played them. Knowing what I know now, I recognize that I did end up missing out on what's considered the true golden ending, along with the epilogue, but that didn't seem as mandatory as getting the standard good ending. It was also because I didn't meet the requirements to get the true golden ending, so I figured there was no point in beating myself up over this. I eventually felt that way, and yet once I thought about how I got the bad ending, I knew I had to do something about that. It was through two steps that I was eventually able to get the good ending. One, 
I used all of the available save files. I started doing this from the start because I've previously had to deal with games where I ended up backed into a corner and the solution was either restart, stay stuck, or continue on ahead with the bad outcome I was trying to avoid. It was because of this that I was thankful to have used all of the save slots, and if you haven't played P4G, I recommend you do the same. After this, I used the spoiler free guide to see the correct responses required to move forward. Part of me felt as if I was cheating myself, but at the same time, I felt like the dialogue responses needed to get the standard ending were a bit strict. You could say that I partially spoiled myself, but if doing that would allow me to continue on, I was all for it. Had I not done this, I would have missed out on what could be considered the default ending. With how things played out for me, it's possible that all of this happened because this could be considered my first real experience with the Persona slash SMT series. Even if having to deal with this was annoying, at least it was different. Things were different and part of me applauds the developers for taking risks such as this one, but there's still part of me that would prefer for this to be done with the gameplay elements rather than the narrative ones. It's mainly because of this, along with other parts, that I felt as if important details of the story were treated as if they were optional side content. With how the story was approached, a lot of important details came off as hidden, and rather than getting the full experience right from the start, I had to work for what other games would have presented as solid material. I didn't know this at the time, but after what I went through, it made sense why Heaven's boss was as hard as he was to beat. It was only after I had gone through all of this that I started to recognize that it was possible for P4G to end after the Heaven Dungeon. Technically, depending on where you go with the story, he could count as the final boss. Part of me wants to say that that was clever of the developers and yet I'm still bothered that I kind of fell for this false ending. It's my fault that this happened to me and yet I think I would have preferred for this to have not been doable at all. I was eventually able to go back and continue from a safe point close to this situation, but I wonder how many people ended up in the same place as I did and were unable to resolve it as easily due to not having multiple save files. Moving on to a different part of this area, I want to say that I was a bit confused with where they decided to go with Teddy's part of the story. For most of it, Teddy is more or less puzzled about his origins, who he is, and what the future holds for him. You eventually realize that even if Teddy could be viewed as an outsider within the group of friends, he's special. There is a point in the story where Teddy is completely down on himself. He says he's just a shadow and that he's not special, but the entire game more or less shows that's completely wrong. It wasn't just because Teddy was a clown that brought a different kind of energy to the group, but because he was someone that could be relied upon. With how this part of the story approached Teddy's role, it probably would have made more sense had you had to fight him in the beginning. Had you had to fight Teddy in the beginning, it would have been easier to accept that Teddy was in fact a shadow. Right from the start, Teddy is definitely anything but normal, and yet it feels hard to accept that he's just a shadow. It's true that the shadows come in all shapes and sizes, but I don't recall any other shadow being as warm and friendly as Teddy. You could say that the dungeon's mini bosses had more in common with Teddy than the general shadows you encountered, but even then, Teddy stands above the rest of them. In general, I had more issues with the story. I enjoyed the subject matter and specific situations that stood out because of what was being said or the message that was being expressed, but there were still plenty of parts that left me thinking that they could have been handled differently. When it's eventually revealed that Adachi is the killer, I felt as if there should have been more buildup towards him being uncovered. I guess you could say that him coming off as a bumbling buffoon was just him masking his real personality, but at the same time, there was no real reason to suspect him. Some will say that that's exactly why it makes sense for Adachi to have been the killer, but this revelation and Adachi's reasons as to why he did what he did felt like it was hastily being thrown together to get to the ending. With how long P4G is, Adachi's development as a character could have been more spread out over its entirety, rather than leaving so many revelations towards the end. When I confronted Adachi and saw what it was all leading towards, I thought that Adachi's 180 degree turn was sudden and it seemed to have come out of nowhere. Frankly, it felt weird. Though I'm aware that it's possible for sudden and drastic changes to occur in stories, I would have preferred for small signs to have been thrown in every now and then. It could be that that's exactly what the writers of this story did, by having you run into Adachi multiple times, but even then, I don't think this was as handled as well as it could have been. One of the first things that comes to mind in regards to that is that Inaba is a small town and with a small police department that's understaffed. This is seen multiple times, but there is one specific instance where I remember seeing Adachi directing traffic because no one else was available. Alongside that, Adachi is your uncle's partner. I don't consider it strange to be familiar with your loved one's co-workers. I know that some may think that I'm nitpicking and splitting this part of the story apart, 
but it's because I think this is particularly weak. Whenever you ran into a dachi, he was awkward and stumbling over himself. At the time that this was happening, the reason for a dachi acting the way that he was acting was due to him being caught slacking off while on the job. It would make sense for him to be acting this way as a result of that, and some might even go so far as to say that Adachi was masking his true intentions by behaving this way, but I'm not convinced with that explanation. I say all of this and state that I think that it could have been handled in a much better way, and yet this Adachi turn was to the point where I was reminded of the usual suspects and Kaiser Soze. The difference between Adachi and that character was that the journey to the shocking revelation was handled differently. It could be that my impression of Adachi and how he was used could have been different had I interacted with him on a more regular basis, and possibly even maxed out his social link, but I'm pretty sure that wouldn't have changed how the concrete interactions meant to progress the story were received. I wasn't happy with how Adachi was utilized in this story and there's more that I'll get into later on, but one thing's for sure, parts of the story hit me hard. I realize that some of you may find it a bit silly or unbelievable, but I felt that the ending and the messages it was attempting to convey were relatable to ongoing real life events. I realized that not every developer is attempting to make a deep statement or something, but with how I interpreted moments of this story, I'm sure that the developers will be happy to know that their game can be connected to a specific moment in time. There were multiple messages that stood out to me, but the main one was that humanity could overcome difficult situations through cooperation. Also. The combined sadness and happiness seen through the characters as they said their goodbyes to the main character was touching. P4G did a good job in knowing when and how to balance different emotions being evoked while not going too far in one direction. P4G had plenty of emotional moments spread throughout its entirety, but this particular moment felt different, seeing as how it was the ending. P4G's emotional content worked on me and I appreciate that, seeing as how I see being able to invoke an emotional reaction out of a player to be the sign of a great game but that still doesn't change that I was frustrated with how it was paced. For the first 10 to 20 hours, I was fine with what it asked of me. Everything felt new and fresh, so I didn't mind doing what I would eventually begin to view as mundane activities. Unfortunately, it eventually got to the point where I was hoping P4G would start doing something else besides X person being tossed into the TV, so now I'd have to go into a dungeon to get them. A great deal of it was like this and it got to be pretty repetitive. I was around 20 to 30 hours into P4G when I started to see this pattern and that bothered me. I'm not saying that a game has to be full of constant surprises and unpredictable moments in order to keep me entertained, but I also think that P4G relied on this too much in order to tell parts of the story it wanted to tell. It's possible that all of this could just be seen as a foundation of what was to be told later on, but even if things were meant to be viewed that way, it still doesn't change that it got old being able to see where the story was going before it got to where it wanted to go. Had this been avoided, it's possible that P4G could have been shorter than it ended up being. I get older and one of the complaints I see myself frequently making is that some games are longer than they need to be. It could also just be due to me having a massive backlog of games that I'd like to beat and starting to prefer games that are to the point with what they want to achieve. Even then, I think that P4G could have at least been 15 hours shorter than it needed to be. I realize that there are some gamers out there that want slash need to get the most out of every game that they buy but I like to think that games don't have to be as long as possible to be considered good. I don't mind playing long games, but I do mind when they're longer than they need to be. Even if more than half of P4G could be considered well paced, the parts that came off as padding stick out to me. Maybe it's because P4G got me used to rescuing characters and then being able to play as them, but having to complete an entire dungeon to rescue Risei and not getting to use her for combat, like the other party members, left me feeling a bit deflated. When I saw that things weren't going to change and that Risei would just be in a supporting role, I figured that she would have been better off as one of the side characters he encountered in the school or around town. It was kind of like the athletes that you can befriend and bond with along with the other special characters like them. The option to spend time with them was there, but it's not forced upon you to make an effort to interact with them. I did end up doing this and it led to special situations, but I liked being able to decide whether or not I'd spend time with them. Another issue I had with P4G was that multiple portions were slower than they needed to be. It was due to this that I was eventually surprised when it started to make use of time skips to advance the story. It would have been nice to have had the option to do this during earlier points, seeing as how something similar could be done during battles. More specifically, it would have been great to have been able to have skipped multiple days at a time whenever I was in town. I realized that my time in town was sometimes longer than I would have liked because P4G was allowing me to decompress after a dungeon and I'd be able to actively pursue part-time work or other activities that would be unavailable while in the middle of a dungeon. Honestly, 
I really didn't need as much time as I got in between dungeons. This led to certain parts feeling drawn out, so I was surprised to see that P4G skipped ahead from mid-February to late March, essentially pushing me closer to the end of my time in Inaba. As I got closer to the end of P4G, I started to feel as if the developers were teasing me. Just about every time I thought that I was close to beating it, mainly due to the battles and the things that were being shown and said, something else kept happening. I was reminded of the Return of the King and its multiple false endings. In particular, I felt this way when P4G was starting to get sad by showing pictures of the gang saying their goodbyes, only for it to keep on going. This occurred multiple times towards the last 20 hours or so, and that led to things feeling a bit strange. Things felt strange, but the eventual ending was nice. I'm sure that it may not seem this way, seeing as how there was plenty about P4G that I didn't like, but in general, I enjoyed it. It could have been better had some things been different, but it's not to the point where I think it's awful or something. Still, part of me thinks that it isn't as perfect as how it's made out to be. It's to the point where you think that every single moment was amazing when that's not the case. I try to be honest and respectful at the same time, but knowing how some people are, anything less than total adulation is viewed as an attack. When I was first reading about P4G when its PC port was announced, some people were describing it as one of the best RPGs ever. Some even mentioned how they've played it three or even more times since it was initially released. Some have also said that it was because of it alone that they bought a PSP Vita in the first place. I enjoyed a lot that it had to offer and I think it's great, but I don't think it's life changing or anything like that. Part of me thinks that I feel this way because I'm playing a game that was originally released more than 12 years ago. What may have felt as groundbreaking back then might just be the norm nowadays. I know that it's technically 8 years since its release, seeing as how this is the golden version, but at the same time, some of my favorite games were released more than 20 years ago. The 98 version of Resident Evil 2 is one of my favorite games, and yet I don't care that a great number of people nowadays view it as unplayable, due to its tank controls. Maybe it's just because the nostalgia goggles make me ignore that game's flaws, but I still think that a good game will always be good no matter how long it's been since its initial release. P4G is largely a linear game and yet with how open-ended some parts could be, one thought I kept having was that this is the type of game that depends on how you approached it. Still, I'm sure that my experience with it greatly varied from someone else's. Chances are that someone controlled old party members by themselves from the start, actually worked a job, and aimed to max out everyone's social link. I did all of that to a certain extent and I also think that I did a decent number of side quests slash content, but at the same time, I just went with the flow of things. When it comes to getting into the Persona slash SMT series, the internet is filled with curious people asking where and how they should start. In response to that, a lot of people say that you could more or less start anywhere in the series, but at the same time, Parts of P4G would be better understood had I been more aware of what the series is about and what it has to offer. It's like someone playing Yakuza for the first time and being freaked out when you see a grown man in a diaper. For a veteran of the Yakuza series, that's not totally strange within the context of those games. It's possible that someone that's more familiar with the Persona slash SMT series is completely used to the things that I found out of place. I previously mentioned that I feel as if P4G could have been 15 hours shorter than it needed to be. Had I known that it would require nearly 100 hours of playtime, I would have saved it for later. It's because I regularly struggle over deciding whether or not I should stick to quantity or quality when it comes to playing games. The goal is always to enjoy myself and to play games that I'm sure that I'll like, but it's not always easy for me to choose what to play. I try to stick to playing whatever I'm in the mood for, and I know that the true value of games lies in their quality, but I'd be lying if I said that a game's average time it took to beat doesn't float around in my head when I'm deciding whether or not I should start playing it. It's possible that I would have been more willing to put up with its slow paced sections had this been the only game I had to play, but I still think that even then I would have felt that a decent portion of the game was drawn out. Would I recommend P4G? Yes. The thing is, you may be better off buying it when it's on sale. I bought it during the past Steam Summer Sale and I paid full price for it. I acknowledge that $20 for a game that took me around 88 hours to complete is a good deal, but at the same time, I've already seen it at lower prices and I don't think you have to go and buy it once you're done watching this review. I know some of you may think I'm nuts for saying that, seeing as how beloved it is, but that's how I feel. P4G is great, but it could have been even greater. If you're like me, chances are that you have a massive backlog of video games to choose from, so whenever you happen to be in the mood for a lengthy RPG, 
it'll most likely have dropped in price by then. If you enjoyed this content, please feel free to like, comment, subscribe, and share. Thank you very much for watching.